Praise the Lord, we can go to the cross. Well, I am excited about Brother Monty being here. Um, he has some unique messages that get us to think about how God works in our hearts and our minds. I can remember when he preached on a token. And often uh, people will still mention as we're talking, looking for, for those tokens and seeing the hand of God in our lives. Uh, I remember when he preached about depression and uh, talked to us about those battles and those battles of the mind that we have and the encouragement that he is. And I am looking forward tonight that as he comes and delivers another message, what he has for us tonight, he also has a huge heart, loves to help people. My son was traveling down to Heartland Baptist College in Oklahoma, or get ready to travel, and he hit a snowstorm. And I said, usually we go through, he goes through Chicago and then through Illinois. I said, divert to Indianapolis. The storm looks weaker there, and I'll make a phone call. Call Brother Monty on a Sunday night, and he took really good care of my son and the people traveling with him, and just uh, was a great host and helped them, and then got them. Uh, they were able, because of rerouting, to get to college, and a lot of other college students got stuck in the storm. But because of his heart and his help, we were able to avoid that. So he has a special place in my heart. So let's sit back and get ready for something good from Brother Monty tonight. Thank you, Brother Colling. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brother Colling. I was amazed as I was listening to him a moment ago when he was recounting um, some of the messages that I purportedly have preached here at this church. I don't remember any of that. And, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but it sounds really good. I'm sure those were interesting messages, and uh, maybe I should look those up again sometime. I'm just, just joking about that. I want to say what a privilege it is to be back at First Baptist Church in Bridgeport, Michigan, my favorite church in Michigan. What a great place. And uh, because I've, I've been honored to come here several uh, years in a row and preach uh, to you folks. I feel like it's at home and I feel like it's family. Um, Brother J.D. Howell, of course, conveniently planned his vacation during the time that, that I would be here. And, uh, and I, I guess I understand that. He said, Brother Monty, he said, you just do whatever you want. And I said, you shouldn't tell me that. That's not a good idea. Now, before I get too far into this, there is something I'm having a dilemma with. I don't have a wristwatch on and there's no clock in the back of the auditorium. You know, in my church, when I struggled to see this little round clock they had in the back, you know, with age, how many you know with age that just happens, you struggle a little bit. Uh, when I struggled to see it, some of the deacons noticed that right away, and they said, uh, Pastor, you know, you're struggling to see the clock, we'll get you a bigger one. And they got this huge digital, huge digital clock to tell me, basically, and, and, and when, if I preach too long, they can make it blink. And so uh, something grabbed my attention. I don't have a clock, so um, what time is it? 7.24. Okay, Jay Tidball, whom I'll introduce in a moment, Jay, at 8 o'clock you're going to raise your hand and get my attention, okay? You're going to do that. Now, don't lie, okay? I mean, I want it to be 8 o'clock, okay? And, then, and that doesn't mean, by the way, I'm going to quit. It just means that I'm being cautioned, okay? I'm in, in cautionary mode there. Uh, I want to introduce Jay Tidball. He is my friend. Uh, he is, uh, he's, uh, he volunteered to come up, actually you were drafted, to come up and uh, uh, drive me up here today. I don't like to come by myself. My wife could not be with me because she cares for my mother who's 91. And so, uh, so Jay um, was willing to come up at my request to drive me. Jay also has the distinction, he's a phenomenal musician. Um, he's a great piano tuner. So if your piano needs tuning, well, you don't have your tools, though, do you, Jay? Okay, forget it. But anyway, he's a great, uh, he's a great musician. Also, also, he is my personal trainer in weightlifting. And uh, so he's a, he's a good all-around guy. And glad to have Jay with us tonight. Then also, Billy Walsh and his wife. Glad to have you, Pastor Walsh. Where do you pastor again? Emmanuel Baptist Church in Sandusky, is that correct? And uh, so just brand new there as pastor, everyone, in your great state of Michigan. So please encourage him and his young wife uh, in the work that uh, the Lord's called them to. He was one of my students back at Indiana Baptist College. And for a number, number of classes you took from me, by the way, always very intelligent, or at least reasonably so, and a uh, very good student. We're glad to have him here. Then I, I do need to say, say one more thing. How many uh, of the men in the room, how many know... A young man who is a pastor out, assistant pastor out in Douglas, Wyoming, Jeremy Paradowski. How many know? Look at, look at several hands have gone up. Okay, for those hands that have gone up, special greetings from Jeremy Paradowski. He knew that I was coming here. I preached at the church, I think it was back in February, somewhere earlier in the year, and he and I have become incredibly close friends, very, very good friends. Let me tell you, those of you who have, have experienced his ministry, he loves you. 
He prays for you. He is the real deal. And so uh, you've got a blessing in that. I just wanted to greet you. All right, take your Bible with me. Turn to John chapter 20. John chapter 20 in your Bible. While you're turning there, um, who would have thought a year ago, it was approximately a year ago that I stood in this pulpit, who would have thought one year ago that we would be where we are today as a nation? Who would have thought of that? If you had told me one year ago that we would be in the grips of uh, what they call a pandemic, uh, and you would have told me that the newest thing to do is to wear masks. Oh, by, by the way, by the way, uh, you know what I'm hearing? Three pastors last week called me to discuss this issue of the mask. And one pastor said this, he said, Pastor Monty, my church is about to split over it. Now, now wait, look this way, everyone, look this way. All of you are better than that. Did you hear what I just said? All of you are better than that. Okay, well, and I said, what do you mean your church is going to split over this? He said, well, we have some people that are saying, you know, if, 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 if you wear that mask, you're not patriotic. And we're not going to wear the mask. And then, then he said, we've got another group of people who are saying, if you don't wear the mask, you're not even saved. <laughs> There's a, there, okay, okay, l let, me, let, me, let, me, let me help you with something. I gave this to my church, okay? I gave this to my church. Um, first, you jot this down and look at it later. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 8 is the perfect verse for this. Paul was dealing with the issue of meat offered to idols. Should we eat it? Should we not eat it? And basically, in, in chapter 8, verse 8, he says this, uh, If you eat the meat, neither are you the better. If you don't eat the meat, neither are you the worse. Okay? It is your choice. Okay? Now, the choice you make... Don't push that choice off on somebody else. Does everybody follow what I'm saying? And by the way, don't criticize people for their personal choice. Do you know why? The devil would like nothing better than to get in people's hearts and minds and divide the people of God in a local church over something that is a preference issue, okay? It is a preference issue. Do not, this church is, Brother Colling, this church is better than that, okay? They're, they're, they're not going to do that. But I caution you because three pastors last week contacted me and said, what do we do about this problem, okay? Um, of course, you're more mature Christians probably than those people and, and uh, you're just better people. You're, you're just a, a quality of people over we're all here in Michigan, so you're not going to worry about something silly like that. Uh, but who would have thought, now listen to this, who would have thought a year ago that I'd be talking about this? Oh, Brother Monty, do you wear a mask? Sometimes I do, when I want to go to Menards. I have to, okay. <laughs> I love Menards, I love Menards. Sometimes I do. Generally not, because it would cover up this epic beard, and I don't... <laughs> I, I don't want to rob people of that, okay? I don't want to rob people of that experience, and so I'm, I'm being, being gracious to them. But who would have thought, who would have thought that our nation would be gripped with civil unrest? A year ago, think with me. Who would have thought that a year ago? He said, Pastor Monty, and, and I've had people say this, they may be worded differently, but they'll say something like this, where is God in the middle of all of this? Where is God in a pandemic that has taken over 100,000 lives? Where, where is God in a time when everything seems uncertain in our nation and everything seems like a shifting sand? Pastor Marty, where is God? That's on the big level. But everyone in this room, if you've been a Christian for any length of time or on the planet for any length of time, you could probably recall a time in your life, maybe you're going through it right now, when you asked yourself the question, where is God? Now, now you're a Bible believer. So you never cross the line, but you come awfully close to the line. How many have read the book of Job? Have you read the book of Job? Okay, Job sinned not with his lips. At the end of the book of Job, God tells Job's three friends, look, you're in trouble. Job better pray for you, and you need to make sacrifice. He never says that to Job. But have you ever read the book of Job and noticed that Job says some things that get right up to being uncomfortable? How many have noticed that? He does. He does. Now, by the way, that's God giving us the transparent heart of the, of the man Job. He reveals what this man was thinking. But at the same time, Job did not sin. We would not cross a line and say, well, all of these bad things prove there could not possibly be a God. We would never say that. But in our hearts sometimes, if we're honest... We're wondering where he is. Maybe not so much in the big things of life, but sometimes in the things that affect our lives personally. Maybe an illness, a sickness, a, a job reversal, some kind of problem. Maybe it's a family problem. Maybe it's a problem in your home that is so private you wouldn't dare talk to anyone else in the world about it. And you can't help but wonder sometimes, where is God? John chapter 20. Look at your Bible, please, beginning at verse number 1. John 20, verse number 1. The Bible says, The first day of the week came Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark unto the sepulcher. 
and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. She has been witness to the crucifixion. Now Mary is going to go to the tomb of Jesus to further prepare his body and to do the things that they had to do in haste at the time of the crucifixion. Mary has come. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto him, note the words of Mary, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. Do you see in that verse the despair that is in her voice? Total despair. Total despair. Where is the Lord? She had come to be an aid and a help and to fi finalize and finish some of the preparations of the burial. They've taken away my Lord. I not, know not where they have laid him. Verse number three, Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple. Now, by the way, that other disciple was John, the human penman of the book of John. He doesn't refer to himself by name, but we know that that is the case. We'll point that out as we go through a little further. So the Bible says, Peter therefore went forth, that other disciple, John, and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together and the other disciple did outrun Peter. Spasmani, how do you know it was John? Well, John was the human penman of the book of John under the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but John had to point out that he beat Peter in a foot race. Okay, I, I like that about John. By the way, men are always competitive. Sometimes ladies get a little grieved by this. Let men compete. This was great competition. So uh, John points out, under divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit, of course, John points out that he did outrun Peter. I love that, don't you? So if I'd been writing that, I would have written the same thing. Or I would have said, my beard's more awesome than Peter's. I, something. Something would have come, come out of my pen. They came to the sepulcher, verse 5. And he stooping down, this is John now, looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulcher. Now you know what I like about Peter? I love his boldness. I love his boldness. I love how Peter just says it, just does it, doesn't hesitate. Do you all like that about Peter? I love that about Peter. It's my personality. Just jump right in and see what happens. That was, was Peter. Simon Peter, following him, went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen clothes lie. Now, the linen clothes are mentioned two times, okay? There is significance in that because that was the, the clothing, the cloth with which they wrapped the body of Jesus. Remember, when Lazarus was called forth by Jesus to come out of the tomb, uh, he, they told Jesus, told them, loose him and let him go. By that, they meant cut those cloth that, cloth that had been wound around him so that he is now free to go, but he has come back to life. In this case, the cloth was not cut. It was simply laying there. I I think in the form of the body of Jesus as he rose I believe that he rose right through that cloth it's significant and the napkin verse number seven that was about his head not lying with the linen clothes but wrapped together in a place by itself then went in also that other disciple the, this is John which came first to the sepulcher <laughs> do you notice that he came first do you know why he got there first how many know because he won the race do you see John just put that little dig right in there? I, I love it when John does that. The one who came first, the sepulcher, he saw, now note these words, and he believed. Now, what did he believe? We're not actually told. It was all just starting to come together for the disciples what had taken place. But John believed something miraculous had happened. Maybe he didn't know what. John believed something had taken place. There was some evidence. That's going to be important later on in the sermon. The Bible says this, for as yet they knew not the scripture. So John believed, but as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. Verse number 11. But Mary, she did not go home. Why do you think Peter and John went home? Anyone have an idea? You ought to know it was Sunday. They didn't want to miss football. Peter and John went home. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher, and seeth two angels in white sitting one at the head and one at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. When crisis arises, we ask ourselves a question, where is Jesus? Some people in our world today ask that question in skepticism. They look at all the negativity of the world and they say, there are so many bad things in this world, there couldn't possibly be a God, and if there is a God, where is he? Some people act with, uh, ask the question with utter contempt. They have no interest in the things of God and they use all the negativity of our world to demonstrate in their mind that God does not exist. Some people ask in disappointment. 
wishing that God somehow would step out of the heavens and transform everything in our world, or perhaps step out of the uh, heavens and correct a situation in your life, in your family, or in the lives of one of your loved ones. Some, I think, genuinely ask in sorrow, where is God in the midst of the crisis? I'm going to teach you something tonight that's so simple it's almost embarrassing, but it is this. God is always in the midst of our crisis. God is always in the midst of our crisis. Now listen carefully, but we must look for him. God is always in the midst of our crisis, but we must look for him. It is not always obvious where he is, but he is always there. Mary's search for Christ in the crisis ultimately paid off. We'll look at that further on in the chapter. But unlike Peter and John who went home to watch the football game, unlike Peter and John, Mary stayed there seeing if somehow she could get a glimpse of Jesus. I want us to discover in this passage the steps that it took to see Christ. Because listen carefully, if you're in the midst of a crisis, or one day you will be, or you're looking at the world today and saying, this world is in such horrible condition, where is God? There are certain steps that take place where he reveals himself in the crisis, here is the key, to those who are looking for him. I want to say something. As negative as life is today, no one should ever give in to the temptation to become a cynic. Cynicism is poison to the soul. But Pastor Martin, you know, I, I, I just cannot believe that everything is wonderful. It is not all wonderful, but God is still there. Pastor Martin, I, I just cannot believe that, that everything's going to turn out all right. Everything won't turn out all right necessarily, but let me say, God is still there. Uh, Pastor Martin, I, I cannot just put on those rose-colored glasses of pious Christianity and somehow whistle a happy tune when the whole world is crumbling. The whole world may be crumbling, but let me say something. God is still there. And rather than ever go the route of cynicism, I as a believer need to be one who looks for Jesus. Let me give you the steps, because these are steps that Mary took. And boy, Mary ended up on the right place, number one. And you could write this down. The first step is this. We may not see him at first, but he is there. We may not see him at first, but he is there. What happened? In verse number one, Mary came early to the sepulcher. Her first impulse after the crucifixion was to find the body of Jesus. She needed after the, the, the Sabbath day, which would be Saturday, she needed after the Sabbath day to go finish the preparation for the burial. Her mind was spinning. This was Mary Magdalene, the Mary out of whom Jesus had cast seven devils. Her mind was spinning because this one who had transformed her life, this one that she had followed, this one that she had loved, and frankly, this one in whom she had pinned her hopes had died and she had been present at the crucifixion and she knew it he had died she knew where they laid him she went there as quickly as she could you say pastor why would she go i think at least in part because there would have been some comfort in ministering the last and final preparation of the body of jesus I think just to look upon his face, it was undeniable what he had done for her. And he knew the words that he had spoken, and his heart was warmed by the presence of Christ. And maybe at this moment, this dear lady just needed to be close to Jesus if it were only but a dead body. Mary went to the sepulcher early. She sought after Jesus. She remembered what he had done. Mary looked for Jesus. She looked into that sepulcher, did she not? But she did not find him. Now here's something interesting, though. When the sepulcher was empty, Mary made three bad assumptions. Now, I want you to think with me for a moment. I'm going to go through those quickly, but I want you to think. Sometimes when we see something, we interpret as a crisis or a problem. When something hits our lives that is outside of our control and a set of circumstances depends, uh, descends upon our lives in such a way as to shake us to the very foundation, it is very natural for us to make certain immediate assumptions, which often are not true. Mary made some of these. First, when she did not see Jesus in the sepulcher, she assumed this. Well, he isn't there. Now, I think almost everyone in the room knows the rest of the story. Later on, he's going to reveal himself fully to her and that he had been standing there the entire time. 
Sometimes when something hits our lives really hard, all of a sudden we look around and we say, there is no way that this piece can fit into the puzzle of my life. There is no way that there can be anything orderly or sovereign or divine about this. How could God allow this? And we look around and we say, wait a minute, God may not even be there. What a dangerous assumption. Mary made that assumption. Mary also assumed, number two, that there must be an, a natural explanation. Do you know what she said? She said, they have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they have laid him. Isn't that interesting? She assumed that someone must have come and taken away the body. Maybe it was grave robbers. Maybe it was the Roman soldiers. Maybe it was the Jews had taken away the body for some reason, the enemies of Jesus. But somebody has done this. Let me say that a natural explanation for everything often falls far short. God uses the natural world and the natural order to do things. But sometimes God is working in a way that is deeper and bigger than we could ever know. Mary made this assumption that, that, uh, that it's just a natural explanation. In other words, by assuming it was a natural explanation, Mary, in a sense, assumed that the crisis was bigger than God. Well, these things just happen in this world. Nothing just happens in this world. Mary was kind of making an assumption that forces other than God must be in control. Those people took away his body. He's gone. Isn't it funny? Isn't it funny how we can listen to years of preaching? I mean, you get good preaching at this church. You get good preaching at this church. You, and I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about J.D. I'm talking about Dr. Willette. I'm talking about the other pastors of this church. You get great preaching at this church. Isn't it funny how we can listen to years of preaching and then all of a sudden something shakes our life up and it's almost like we forget all about that? And somehow we think, well, God must not be in control anymore. May I say something to you? God's not in control just when things are going well for you. God's in control when things are not. The great lesson of the book of Job is this, that God was in control the entire time, that even Satan was put on a tight leash by the Lord and was limited in the things that he could afflict Job with. Why? Because whether it is good or whether it is bad, God is in control. Mary had walked with the Lord. She'd heard him preach. She knew him on a personal level. And yet all of a sudden she was assuming that forces other than God are in control. These people have come and take away, taken away his body. The default explanation was something in Mary's mind, well, this must be humanly explicable. We've got to be able to explain this by a human thing. Someone must have taken away the body of Jesus. Very dangerous assumptions to make when someone assumes they're in a crisis. But here was the problem. Mary missed the subtle evidence, the subtle evidence that something special had happened. Now, in verses 3 through 10, the Bible is clear. Peter and John did not miss that. They didn't get it all, and why they went home, it's got to be the football thing. I can't even figure that out. They didn't get it all, but when Mary reported to Peter and John, Peter and John came to the sepulcher, and they saw the evidence of something unique. They saw grave clothes that were empty. I don't know if they went through their mind and thought about this, but if someone were going to steal the body of Jesus, you wouldn't want to unwrap it, but these weren't even unwrapped. They were still in the bodily form. The napkin was laid aside and set aside. That was like a veil, a head covering. It was a shroud. The burial shroud was laid aside, and it was folded neatly in a corner. And who would do that if you were robbing the grave? Why? You would sneak in. You would grab the body as quickly as possible, wrapped in everything. It would be gone. That's why the Bible says later that John believed. What did he believe? Well, the Bible says they didn't understand the Scripture, but he sure believed that something had happened. I'm suggesting that while Mary didn't see the evidence, Peter and John saw the evidence of something unique. They saw that the headpiece had been removed and folded to the side, and all of the grave clothes were lying there undisturbed, not unwrapped. At the very least, the Bible says that John believed something unique had happened. Can I, can I tell you this? When you go into a crisis... It is at that moment you need to start looking for the evidence of God. Now let me tell you, God's fingerprints are over every aspect of your life. Oh, Pastor Monty, God's been so good to me. He's blessed me. He's blessed me with the finances to buy a brand new. Have any of you seen that Jeep, the new Jeep that looks like a pickup truck? How many have seen that? Guys, have you seen that? I test drove one of those. 
uh, because I was so curious about it. But it, I, you said, Pastor, did you buy one? No. No, I told the man I would buy one if I won the lottery. I went out and bought tickets. Nothing happened. Just, just, just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. I have to say just kidding. People don't get me sometimes. Pastor Monty bought lottery tickets. No, I did not buy lottery tickets. I had my wife do it, okay? There was, someone says, I've got, and I bought one of these brand new Jeep things that look like a pickup truck, and God's really good. Can I tell you something? God is good if you're driving a Ford Pinto. Because our, well, maybe not. That was a little extreme. <laughs> God is good regardless. It's so easy for us when things are going well for us to say, Oh, it's so wonderful. God is good. But then the moment things go bad, sometimes people get bitter. They get angry with God. They turn on God. And they fail to look for the evidence that God is doing something bigger. In 30 plus years of pastoring, I have had a front row seat to the lives of hundreds of people. And it has been remarkable for me when someone goes through a crisis in my own personal life, having gone through a crisis and wondering, not out loud, of course, because I'm a pastor, but wondering, where is God? Then all of a sudden, I start looking around. And here's evidence after evidence after evidence. Peter and John saw that. Mary did not take notice of that right away. The Bible says John believed. The disciples, of course, did not understand the resurrection fully, but John believed something unique had happened. Brother Colin mentioned a moment ago my sermon from Psalm 86, a token for good. If some of you were here a long time ago, you maybe don't remember it. Um, but the whole idea of that sermon is ask God to show himself in the middle of a trial. And if you're looking, if you're looking, God will do just that. If I look for evidence when I can't see Jesus, I will see evidence of the fingerprints of God. So, Pastor Monty, is, 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 that, is, that, is it a big thing where all of a sudden there's some epiphany? <laughs> Not usually. It's a little thing where a set of circumstances in the midst of a trial come together in a unique way and the Holy Spirit whispers to your heart, I'm still here. But I'm suggesting that the first step in seeing Jesus in the midst of the trial, the first step is to realize we may not see him at first, but he is still there. I need to look for him. There's a second step, however. I must hasten a second step. The first step is we may not see him at first. He's still there. Step number two is this. We may not recognize him at first, but he eventually reveals himself. We may not recognize him at first, but he eventually reveals himself. Look at verse number 11. Because the story gets interesting. Right now there's a conundrum. John believes something, but he doesn't know what. Mary is standing there. And then all of a sudden, uh, Mary standing outside of the sepulcher weeping. She wept, she stooped down, looked into the sepulcher, and seeth two angels in white, sitting one at the head, the other at the feet, and where the body of Jesus had lain. Isn't seeing two angels better than watching football? Come on, guys, say yes. You're going to ruin the sermon if you don't say yes. It was a good thing, a good thing she hung around the sepulcher, was it not? Peter and John went home, but Mary stayed at the sepulchre. Verse number 12. Seeth two angels in white sitting, one at the head, one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto him, and I know this again, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. Again, she's making certain assumptions here. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing, now note these words, and knew not that it was Jesus. Now, remember we said Jesus is always there in the midst of the crisis. We said that already. But she didn't recognize him at first. The disciples had gone home. Mary stayed. Mary, her waiting paid off. She saw the angels. But she did not recognize Jesus. He had been there the entire time. But now she sees someone. She doesn't know whom. Later on, the Bible says she thought, well, that must be the gardener, the guy who takes care of the plants and the flowers in the cemetery. That must be who that is. He was there the whole time. When she saw him, she did not recognize him. Why would that be? Can I share this with you? Because it wasn't what she was expecting. Remember the assumption she had made? She had already convinced herself that what had taken place at the sepulcher was likely a crime, the robbing of a body. She already convinced herself of that. She knew what had happened here because obviously it couldn't be something beyond the natural. She understood that in her mind that this was some kind of crime. They've taken away Jesus. I don't know where they've laid him. She got so wound up in what was a crisis. Now, let's pause for a minute. Let me ask you a question. <clears throat> Is the empty tomb a disaster? Yes or no? 
good. That wasn't a trick question. Some of you are like, I gotta, I gotta think this one through and go just ask my Sunday school teacher. No, 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 no. The empty tomb was not a disaster. Mary was looking at it as the worst disaster possible because Jesus is no longer there. The body is gone. She had no idea. The empty tomb, folks, is not a disaster. It is something we rejoice at because it is ultimate victory. She just didn't see it. She didn't understand. It really wasn't what she was expecting. May I submit to you that it is not God's job to meet your expectations? It is your job to bow in reverence to His will. That's hard sometimes. Because sometimes you go to the doctor and maybe there's a very negative diagnosis. At that moment, you bow to His will and trust Him. That's what we should do. It's, it's hard sometimes when God doesn't do what we want. It's hard sometimes when God doesn't seem to answer our prayers. I've had sincere people, Christian people, come to me and say, Pastor, I prayed about this. I prayed, I prayed, I prayed. Why won't God answer my prayer? I get discouraged with that. Follow me on this. God does not have to meet my expectations. That, that was a problem. That was an assumption that, that was taking place here. That, that is not uh, the thing that we need to focus on. God does not necessarily meet all of my assumptions. It was not what Mary was expecting. It was not what she had assumed. And notice how Mary goes straight to the natural again. Oh, they've taken away his body. Natural explanation. Ah, oh, this guy standing here, that's just the gardener. Another natural explanation. It's not what she assumed. It's not what she had convinced herself of, that Jesus was taken away. There he stood. It is natural and normal, sometimes in a crisis, for the crisis to cloud our sight. Jesus is always there. We may not see him. Look at this. Jesus is there. We may not recognize him. I had Brother Cowling an incident, incident uh, Sunday before last. Um, Saturday, I was mowing my, my lawn. How many guys love to mow your lawn? Do you love to mow your lawn? What? <laughs> oh, oh, it's because you don't have a Dixie Chopper zero-turn radius motor, mower with a 26-horsepower. Okay, I understand. My favorite things is to mow the lawn. It, it got all dusty. It was dry down in Indiana. It got all dusty. And so um, I, was, I, I thought, you know, the dust was in my eyes. This, this right eye kind of got kind of cloudy and weird. And uh, so when I was done, I sat down, and then I coughed real hard. And then how many you ever have those floater things in your eyes? Anyone those funny things that float around in your eyes? Okay. And, and that increased dramatically. Like a bunch of them just came. And I thought, well, this is kind of weird. And I ignored it. And then that evening, I noticed that when I would look to the right there would be a flash of light, like arcing light to the right. Now, I knew that was not a good sign. I, I knew that was not a good sign. And so you know what I did? I did what every man in this room would do. I said to myself, self, it'll go away by tomorrow. Because that's what guys do. I woke up the next morning, and it was worse. And the, the arc of light, and this is Sunday morning. This Sunday morning, the arc of light is flashing, and I'm not really seeing well out of that eye. I called an eye doctor friend. He opened up his office at 8.15, did an exam. He said, you need immediate attention. He called a friend in Bloomington, Indiana, who owns a practice there who could take care of it, laser surgery. By 10.30 that morning, by the way, isn't that a miracle of God? 10.30 on a Sunday morning with no appointment, I go into an office that the doctor has opened up for me, and he treats me immediately. Now, the whole treatment was, took five minutes for the whole treatment. I, it was unbelievable. And the doctor said, now, I'm going to hold your eye open, and we're going to shoot a laser beam into your eye, and it's going to be bright, and it's going to blink. And then he said this. He said, hold your eye, look up and to the left. How many can do that? You can do that, right? My like, God, look, do it right now. Yeah. Isn't it weird when someone tells you to do it, it's hard to do? It's like you have to think about it. It's dumb. But then he said this. He said, look up and to the left. And he said, and don't move your eye. I have never been so tempted to move my eye in my life. I, I, and, 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 and he started beep, 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 beep. And this beam starts flashing in there. And then it starts burning. He said, Pastor Monty, what were they doing? I don't know. <laughs> but they were bur burning. He put it all back together, and, and the, the dimness, after probably five minutes after the procedure, the dimness went away. By the way, that was a torn retina. You never want to have something like that. The dimness went away. 
Sometimes a crisis comes into our lives and it clouds our ability to recognize Jesus. Do you know why? We become so obsessed with the crisis, we don't look beyond it to see him. I was so obsessed with this light flashing in the corner of my eye that I kept looking to the right to make it flash. I kept watching those little floater things go across, and I was only looking at the thing that was the closest. It was actually inside the eye. I was looking at that. I wasn't looking for anything else beyond that. And folks, sometimes a crisis becomes that big in our lives that we become so obsessed with it, it's all we can think about. Pastor Bonnie, I'm going through a hard time. I can't sleep at night. It dominates every thought that I have. I'm constantly uh, plagued by the worry and the concern and the care about this crisis. That is when you're looking too closely. You're never going to recognize Jesus. It is good for us sometimes to realize our temptation to have clouded vision in regard to this. Mary understood that sometimes, and she came to understand that sometimes our perspective is limited. Our assumptions make Jesus unrecognizable. Do you see this? She had already convinced herself, ah, it's just the gardener. Oh, someone took his body. We don't, we don't know where his body is. Somebody needs to call the police, except they're the problem anyway. And we don't know, you know, the Roman soldiers, they're trouble all the time. And, and, and uh, we don't know where the body's gone. And Mary says, somebody, somebody, you know, this guy over here, he's just the gardener. He won't know anything. Her assumptions clouded her ability to see. And in this case, and I believe this was the case because this happened later in another resurrection, post-resurrection appearance, sometimes Jesus comes to us in a form that we don't immediately recognize. Here she is seeing someone that she assumes is the gardener. But Jesus has come. He was there all the time. But now he reveals himself in a form not recognizable. Can I, can I say something? Sometimes Jesus comes to us in our lives in a form we don't recognize the death of a loved one. Hard pill to swallow, isn't it? Maybe a tragic accident. Maybe it's a diagnosis out of the blue that you were not expecting. Maybe it's a job loss or some kind of family reversal. Maybe it's a trouble in your home. When I was, I was in high school, there was a student who I was probably in, I guess, junior high at this time. There was a high school student who had graduated, so I did not know him well. It was a Christian school, large Christian school. I did not know the young man well. I admired him. He was a big guy. He was strong. He was athletic. Uh, he had a heart for the, the Lord. He wanted to be a missionary. He'd given his life to serve as a missionary. I didn't know him very well personally because I was in a much younger grade, but all the kids looked up to this guy because, after all, he was one of these sterling guys that had it all together and everything was great. And he went, graduated, and went on to do whatever he was doing, planning to go to Bible college somewhere. And, and uh, so I didn't give him much thought. The following year, we had a banquet, and they mentioned that he would come to be the guest speaker. And I hadn't heard anything about him from that time, but I assumed he would come back to tell us how great college was and how good the Lord was doing and all these things. And they had a platform and a stage, and it had a curtain in front of the stage. And so the uh, principal got up in the school and he said, I'm going to introduce our speaker. Most of you know this young man, many of you do. I, being a younger student, didn't know any details of his life. This was before social media and all of that wonderful garbage and so that, that, that dumpster fire. But uh, before all that happened, so nobody knew. And someone, as they introduced him, someone went behind the curtain and wheeled this young man out, big strapping, strong young man, wheeled him out in a wheelchair. I'm like, what? A wheelchair they gave him a microphone and he told this story he said he was working at a lumber yard the summer after he had graduated he said that he was driving a fork truck and the uh, fork truck there was a slight incline to the fork truck a uh, little incline ramp that he had to go up the load that he was carrying was too much and I don't know all about fork trucks some in the room might know more than I but somehow the combination of the incline and the heavy load that he was carrying caused the whole thing to become unstable and then, without being able to back it off of the incline, all of a sudden the fork truck flipped and threw him, and somehow he found himself under the forks turned on their sides, cutting right across his midsection. The pressure of the fork truck forks cutting across his midsection went all the way to his spine. A customer saw this happen. They called the paramedics. They got him to the hospital immediately. He was in the hospital for, for many, many weeks. But as a result of the injury, he would never walk again. This young man told that story. It's very striking to me because when he was done, he said this. He said, in my whole life, he said, I would never have wished for that to happen. Oh, yeah, duh. No one wants that to happen. 
He said, I would have never wished for this to happen. He said, I had dreams and plans of being a missionary. I wanted to do, he listed things he wanted to do. He said, I would have never asked for this. But he said, in the midst of this crisis, he said, I have come to know God in a way I wouldn't trade for anything. Can I share with you that that's the Christian response? God showed up. He wasn't recognizable in the pain that the young man felt during the time of recuperation. He wasn't recognizable necessarily in the words of the doctor speaking to that young man, young man, you will never walk again. But that young man looked at something and said, God has a message for me. God has shown up. I'm saying this to you tonight, that there is a God in heaven who doesn't just show up when times are great, who doesn't just show up when you get a raise, who doesn't just show up when everything's going wonderful, oh, God bless you, everything's so happy. Don't people like that just make you sick? Okay, they're, they're just liars anyway, okay? And uh, no, 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 God shows up. And it's not recognizable sometimes in the depth of my deepest crisis. I want to remind you of that. It is interesting. She did not recognize him at first. But I must give you the third point. Brother Tidball, where am I? 802. I've got time for this. Do you have something else you're doing? You know what the great thing is? Everything's closed. <laughs> you know? You have absolutely nowhere to go. I love it. I love it. The whole state is closed. There's nothing better to do than this. So let's just continue on. The third step. The third step. So, so first of all, we may not see him at first, but he is there. We may not, secondly, recognize him at first, but he reveals himself. Number three, we may not understand him at first, but he has a purpose. Can I read the weirdest part of this story? So Jesus, in verse number 15, notice verse 14. Uh, when she had said thus, he, when, when she had said thus, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing. Now note and knew that it was not him. She didn't recognize it was Jesus. Verse 15. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? Now, she doesn't know this is Jesus. She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and, and I will take him away. Okay, she's again going back to her naturalistic explanation. Verse number 16. Jesus saith unto her, no, 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 he called her woman in verse 15. Woman? Now look what he says in verse 16. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. The moment Jesus spoke her name, there was instantaneous recognition. See, see, there's something about the voice of Jesus speaking your name. May I say this, and those who've been through deep water in this room know exactly what I'm talking about. There's something about the voice of the Holy Spirit in the middle of a crisis speaking the words, peace be still that causes you to recognize Jesus. Jesus saith unto Mary, she turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, now this is where it gets weird. Okay, stop for a minute, stop for a minute, okay? Mary thinks the body's been stolen. Mary thinks that this guy standing here is the gardener. She addresses him as the gardener. All of a sudden, Jesus speaks the word Mary, and Mary recognizes her name being sung from the lips of the Savior. All of a sudden, all of the doubt, the darkness, the cloud, the lack of clarity, it all melts away from her eyes. She recognizes that, what in the world? This is Jesus. And what's the most natural thing you could do? You would want to hug him, would you not? Like, you'd want to, you would want to embrace him. You would want to fall at his feet and worship, but most assuredly, you would want to touch him. Look at verse 17. This is where it gets really weird. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not! Stop! What? But this was 2,000 years before the COVID-19. <laughs> I mean, there's an awful lot of people that are doing that number today. Touch me not! Just remember, they're quoting scripture. <laughs> I mean, honestly, when you read it, it's weird. It's just not natural. Now, look at this. Jesus saith unto her, touch me not, for I'm not yet... A, no. And here's his excuse. Here's his reason. What? This gets weirder. For I'm not yet ascended to my father. Huh? Mary doesn't get this. You got to understand, Mary just realized this is Jesus. 
And Mary just realized all her assumptions were wrong. And Jesus is standing here. Mary had seen him be crucified. She knew he was dead. She knew he, where he was buried. And all of a sudden, Mary recognizes she hears the voice of Jesus. Jesus calls her by name. She acknowledges this is Jesus. She wants to hug him. Jesus said, don't touch me. I'm not yet ascended to my father. Oh, but it gets weirder. <laughs> He says, I'm not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and to your father and to my God and to your God. What in the world was happening? My point number three is this. We may not understand him at first, but he has a purpose. Jesus made his presence known. And the natural response would be to hug him, to worship him, to touch him physically. That would be the natural human response and Jesus said, you cannot touch me. Have you ever read that in the moment of what should be the most touching of reunions? Have you ever read that and felt that that was jarring? It's a jarring remark that Jesus makes. It's, it's almost as if you can picture Jesus stepping back. The embrace would have been something natural. Jesus, though, had a larger purpose to accomplish. Have you ever wondered why Jesus said, touch me not? and then followed it with the words, I must ascend to my Father? The answer to that is found in part in Leviticus chapter 16. Jesus had raised from the dead, been raised from the dead. But the work was not done yet. Now the sacrifice of the cross, it is finished. But there's something else that has to happen. Jesus says to Mary, I, I need to ascend to the presence of the Father. Ah, oh, but we're past money, of course, and that happened like a lot of days later, weeks later, when Jesus ascended on the, the, the ascension. You know the, the ascension. Remember that? That's not what he's talking about here. Do you know how I know that? Because later when Thomas comes into the room, the disciples have seen the Lord. Thomas, for some reason, wasn't hanging out with them. He was at Walmart or something that night. And so, so Thomas comes into the room. They're like, we've seen the Lord. And the Lord appears. And Thomas doubts. Remember doubting Thomas? What did Jesus say? Jesus said to Thomas, reach hither thy finger, touch my side, look at my hands, touch me. And he had not yet ascended in the ascension. What was he talking about here? There was a moment when Jesus would ascend to the Father according to the dictates of Leviticus 16, listen carefully, to perform the ritual and the rite of being our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. You see, the Jews in the Old Testament era had certain regulations for the Day of Atonement. The Jewish priest, the high priest, only could make the Day of Atonement, and he would take off his regular high priestly garb, and he would bathe. There was a ritual bath. It's called a mikvah. It's really like a baptistry. He would go under the waters of the mikvah ritually to represent a cleansing. Then coming out of the waters, he would not put on his daily priestly high priestly garb, but he would put on, the Bible says, Leviticus 16, a completely white garment. He would be immersed. He would put on his white garment. He would enter the Holy of Holies, and then he would sprinkle the blood of the atoning sacrifice on the, mo on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies. When he came out, he would come out, take off those clothes, be immersed again, immerse himself actually in water again, and then put on his other priestly garments. From the moment that he took off the daily priestly garments until he put them back on again, he could not be touched by any man. To be touched by any human being would mean defilement. It was a ritual defilement. And so the high priest, they would step back from him as he would go into the Holy of Holies. We cannot touch him. He has undergone the ritual cleansing, the purification prescribed in Leviticus. He's, he's undergone those things. We cannot touch him until he's done. What was Jesus saying? He was saying to Mary, Mary, touch me not. I have not yet ascended to my Father. Now, take your Bible with me. And turn with me, please, to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. I want to prove this to you from the pages of Scripture. Hebrews chapter 9. Why did Jesus say, touch me not? Because he was about to perform the act as our high priest of the sprinkling of his blood. Look at Hebrews chapter 9. I want every eye on the Bible. The penman of the book of Hebrews, whom I believe to be the Apostle Paul, wrote... Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and of worldly sanctuary. Speaking of the Old Testament tabernacle, first later the temple. 
And there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick, the table, the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, speaking of the holy of holies, which had the golden censer, the ark of the covenant, overlaid round about with gold, wherein was a golden pot that had man, and Aaron's rod that had budded, and the tables of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. And over the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. It was not present in the temple, uh, the second temple. The, these things were not present there. They had been lost in the Babylonian captivity. Verse number 6. Now the penman says this, divine inspiration of the Spirit of God. Now these things were thus ordained. The priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God, taking care of the sacrifices and taking care of the incense and the showbread and all of those things. But in the second went the high priest alone once every year. That's into the Holy of Holies. He did this on the Day of Atonement. Now note these words, verse number 7. Not without blood. The high priest had no purpose to go into the Holy of Holies if he did not carry with him a basin of the blood that had been sacrificed. He offered this blood sacrifice, according to Leviticus first, uh, 16, first for himself and for the errors, then for the errors of the people, the whole nation. Now, now, what does that teach us? The high priest does all these things. He's not touched by anybody as he enters in. Now he presents the blood of the sacrifice on the altar for himself as well as for the sins of the people. Verse number 8, the Holy Ghost thus signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, well as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which is a figure for the time pr then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal or fleshly worldly ordinances imposed on them until the time of the Reformation. Note verse 11, but Christ being come a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands. What's that talking about? The tabernacle in heaven. The place where the tabernacle on earth was patterned from is the real, the perfect tabernacle in heaven. Not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. Look at verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves. Those would have been the sacrifices of the first tabernacle and temple. Look at verse number 12. But by his own blood. Does everyone see that? Now follow where we're going. But by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us all. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, here it is, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? You said, preacher, what are you saying? <laughs> Jesus looks at Mary. She's about to lunge for that embrace. And Jesus steps back and says, touch me not. I've not yet ascended to my father. Listen to this. He had at that moment a greater purpose in this crisis, quote unquote, than Mary could have ever known. She didn't put all of this together. Now Jesus, who has recognized her, called her by name. Now he's stepping back from her and saying, touch me not. Why? Because Jesus had a purpose she didn't understand. When she would go away, Christ would ascend. Now, this is what I believe because the Bible bears it out, and I believe the Bible literally. When he ascended, when Mary left, Jesus ascended into the presence of God. He walked into a physical but heavenly tabernacle. He carried with him his own blood that was shed on Calvary. I can't get anything else out of Hebrews chapter 9 than what I'm telling you. He presented that shed blood, his blood, shed on Calvary's cross. He presented it at heaven's mercy seat. He sprinkled it upon the altar of heaven. And in that moment, he fulfilled every type and promise of the Old Testament. In that moment, Jesus Christ, my high priest, walked into the heavenly tabernacle, put that blood upon the altar. And when I die and walk into the presence of God, I firmly believe I will see in that physical place, that physical real blood testifying forever that that is the final sacrifice wow does everybody see something God has a purpose way beyond what Mary could have understood so here's the message for us don't expect to understand everything but know there's something so much bigger at work See, I don't always see him at first, but he's always there. I don't recognize him, but eventually he reveals himself. 
And I don't understand every purpose, but, but, eventually I'll find there's something far bigger than I could ever know. Do you think Mary was glad she hung around the sepulcher that day? What was to her a crisis became the cornerstone of the Christian faith. He is risen, is risen indeed. What you look at as a crisis in your life right now, if you will look for Jesus, if you will seek to recognize him, if you will understand that in every crisis there is a bigger purpose, what you will come to find is behind that crisis is Jesus Christ. So, Pastor, what if I come to the end of my life and I don't understand some of the things that happen? Paul had an answer to that. I love these words. Paul said this, But now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. And one day, one day, I will stand in his presence and see him face to face. See, I might not see him, but he's always there. I might not recognize him, but eventually he's going to make himself known. And I don't know the bigger purpose, but I can promise you, it's beyond anything you ever imagined. Father, take your word tonight. Help us to see from this story of Mary so eloquently presented to us in pages of Scripture that we have a God we can trust and that every crisis we have, He is present. He's present when we don't see you right away. He's present when we don't recognize you right away. And his purpose, we may not understand it, but the purpose is there and it's bigger than anything we could ever know. God, increase our faith tonight as we seek to look upon the face of Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. We're going to stand to our feet, everyone standing to our feet. And I believe they're going to have the words to a hymn up on the screen. Face to face, it's number 417 in your book. We're going to sing this, but... God spoke to your heart. You just make your way down to the altar. You can right now. The rest of us will sing. You come to the altar. You know how to do business with the Lord tonight, so you just make your way to the altar. We're going to sing together face to face. You come as we sing. Face to face with Christ my Savior. Face to face, what will it be? the message. Think about the Word of God tonight. Notice the words of the second stanza lifted together. Oh, faintly now I see him. Think about it. <laughs> 